Welcome. So the Western Canon course is about basically getting rid of all the noise, focusing on the signal. And the signal starts 2,500 years ago with the Prometheus story, which is the first play that we're going to look at in a deep way in the context of tragedy. Today, I'm going to make some reference probably over the course of the next couple of blocks, make a reference to this book. It's entitled Tragedy, the Greeks and Us by Simon Critchley. I consider him a brilliant man and I'm excited to introduce him and his view of tragedy to you. Really, we're talking about this Troika, Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides. What's interesting about all three of these playwrights and what they produce is their relationship to war. The three tragedians are a product of either the Persian conflicts, and there was two influxes of that, or civil war, the fight between the Spartans and the Athenians. Aeschylus participates in the Battle of Marathon. What he writes as a war veteran, as a combat veteran, is lessons which are performed by other combat veterans. And it's my opinion uh, and belief that their perspective is more important than ever because we're in the midst of a Cold War and I don't think many people are thinking about it deeply and rationally. Um, and if we don't draw from these lessons, I think we endanger not only one another, but our little ones in the future. So um, we're going very far back, but ironically, it's more applicable than ever. So when we talk about tragedy, this comes from Gritchley, of course. Tragedy represents a clash between private and public life. When the two collide and the two collapse. Let me give you an example. Lily, the bigger the moral calling you feel to do good things for the world in politics, what you probably haven't thought about yet is that the bigger the calling, the bigger the cost to you personally. The higher you climb in your public life, the deeper the cost in your private life. The tragedies force us to look at that ambiguous, complicated, disturbing um, fact of life and ultimately challenge us to find our balance. There is no formula for this. Every person has to make a decision about how much they're going to sacrifice of themselves. I'm not uh, one of these people that just talks aimlessly. This institute is a product of sacrifice. Make no mistake about it. <laughs> so I'm living it, yeah? And I want you to understand that if you're gonna do any kind of thing in this world that matters, you're gonna have to give some stuff up that you also want. And it's a question of how much you can take. And Eva, you were talking about um, first generation immigrant. From that perspective, I understand that perspective very well. In the name of your parents, their sacrifice, what they did for you, you have to do well for them. Does that sound familiar? Now, how long are you going to carry that burden? For the rest of your life? Some of your life? It's a burden that you carry, but you choose to carry it, do you not? And therein lies your tragedy. I feel a lot of those types of uh, responsibilities, but I feel a moral responsibility to correct what I feel is an injustice in this world. When you know teachers promise you all sorts of things and then don't deliver on that and leave you unprepared, as you walk into a century that's going to present unprecedented problems, I think that that's intolerable. And I've created a completely different way of thinking about school in order to fight that injustice. Now, I'm obsessed with it in an unhealthy way, but I choose it and I keep choosing it. What you got to figure out in the end is your own little tragedy. Tragedy is not something that happens to you. 
It's not the divine will of the gods that make you suffer, Erfan. You collude with it. Your free will is part of your own little tragedy. And that's what the tragedians really teach us. Tragedy starts with collusion and free will on your part. Eva, how can you let your parents down? You cannot. How is this possible? Who could, who could do such a thing? Who could say, you know what? Enough school. I'm just going to live my life and enjoy whatever. It doesn't work that way, right? I mean, for me, it certainly doesn't work that way. I sometimes wonder how people can make those types of decisions. Second, third generation people can make those decisions. I cannot. I cannot. And I know that that's going to lead to problems, but I choose it. So the goal here is for you to feel it uh, within yourself. These are abstract uh, cases in, in some ways, but the goal of the class is to make you feel this viscerally. So inevitably, it takes forever to go through the place <laughs> because I want each of you to start to feel this. Tragedy is a world of rage, grief, and war, as it turns out. A world with ambiguous morality and partial autonomy. It's actually our world, the world of the tragedies. Ambiguous uh, morality, let's focus on that for a second. The war in Vietnam, you're familiar with this, right? The 60s and 70s. Now most people would regard that war as an unjust war, as an immoral war. I mean, most like <laughs> Noam Chomsky <laughs> inclined people would think this way. The people that went, that volunteered initially for that war, were young men, mostly, who, in the name of freedom and democracy and the ideals of America, went to war. They thought they were fighting for freedom. They got there, and they realized that the words that came from the government and their generals are a mix of overt lies, on the one hand, and on the other hand, a lot of bad information from the generals. The generals don't know. War is confusion. So these young men who went to sacrifice everything, including their own life, they were willing to do this for their country, confront a reality where morality is very ambiguous. Before you go, it's black and white. We're doing it for freedom. You get there, the general doesn't know what's going on, you're in a state of confusion, and whatever you came for, freedom and justice, is not really what you're fighting for because they're telling you go kill innocent people. How is that freedom and justice? Tragedy is a world where the powerful humiliate and destroy the powerless, which happens all the time in our world. The question again is what, what to do about it. It's stories of people who have partial autonomy in a morally ambiguous moment that, that are it's in front of their face, but they can't see it. They act, and in the process, they become destroyed. There isn't like a happy ending here with the tragedies. These are, these are stories of decline and, and destruction. And the goal is to learn from that and to approach your own life with those lessons intact. They perform them around this time of the year, in the fall, the bounty of nature, the harvest. And then things start to gradually diminish. Winter comes. They were performed around this time of the year. In the spring, of course, it's the comedy. It's a much more jovial time. It's a time of rebirth and renewal. In tragedy, time is out of joint, Brandon. The past is not past. The future folds back on itself. Tragedy is about the between time, the boomerang action that we throw out comes back with the potential of total destruction. The easiest way to think about this is like ex-boyfriends <laughs> or ex-girlfriends, simplest uh, version of the problem. You're done with the past, Eva, and you say, enough of that guy, and you've thrown the boomerang. You're done with the past, the past is not done with you. And it'll come back until you learn the lesson. You're never done with the past. You're not done with it until you've resolved the problems that were there. And it's, and it's understandable to want to throw things away that, don't, that you feel don't serve you. Or maybe you think, uh, Eva, let's say, 
I'm not saying this is what you think, but like, for example, you say, ah, oh, China, whatever, that's my parents, that's my grandparents. I'm done with that. I'm moving on with my life. You might be done with it. It's not done with you. <laughs> and until you understand how to integrate it, the past, with all of its painful memories, you'll never be able to move forward um, and, and avoid like destruction, basically. So the thing that breaks you, that shatters you, is the fact that you want to cut yourself away from the past. There's things in your past, in your parents' past, in your grandparents' past, that are embarrassing, shameful things, if you look closely enough. Civilizationally embarrassing, shameful things. If you don't understand those things, if you don't love those things in the end, because if you consider yourself a patriot of China, Junchia, which I think you do, by not disavowing the past, you get a chance to be a true patriot and love the entirety of it, the good and the bad. So the, the tragedy starts in many ways with the decision to disavow. Yes, question. We learn the lesson from the tragedy. Mm. Are we going to avoid the tragedy from happening or we always have new tragedy to live through? And That's actually a very complicated question because I don't think you can ever fully avoid the tragedy. I think everyone in the end has to live the tragedy that they choose. <laughs> So there isn't, again, there isn't like a happy like ending here, um, but it's a, it's a real, it's, it's a lesson in, in reality. I don't think you can avoid it. I think you can avoid some of the mistakes that are, unfortunately, that we trip over over and over again because we don't learn the lessons. So I think you can avoid some major problems, but people have creative ways of creating their own tragedy. And... As I say, if you feel a moral calling, that comes with a sacrifice. That private-public collide, there, there is no way to avoid that. It's just a question of what's the ratio that you can live with. It, it comes down to your pain threshold. So. Um, the big idea to avoid is the disavowal of the past. That's a major lesson. Most wars are sold to the population on the basis of a very superficial understanding of history. Like it, a, 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 a population that is unaware and badly educated is pretty easy to convince to go to war. Especially one that you, know, that you can control the information pretty smoothly. So this is an exercise in not being part of that easy to manipulate population, right? War is not something ever that we should be encouraging. I'm a peace man, Lily. That's my predominant position. I think we have to find a way to break the cycle of violence. And that's what these plays are about. Because if we don't do it generationally, it'll never stop. And in many ways, it's never stopped since the Hellenic time. I don't like politics, I just want to be clear. <laughs> I've studied it, I find it abhorrent. I think it's a, hor it's a horrible thing to, uh, to have to talk about, but I have to talk about it, not because I want to talk about it, but if you don't know what's happening around you politically, there is no chance to retain your freedom as a free-thinking person. So. You have to establish a relationship to politics that allows you to be who you are, a free-thinking thing. And if you don't do that, and you say, a politics is not for me, it'll come to you, and it'll demand from you. Your relationship to the oracle, your relationship to politics, will determine your fate. So here's the, the Thebian trilogy, which we'll eventually arrive at after Prometheus. So it's three plays all by Sophocles, who in some ways is the master, but they're all masters, to be honest, um, that are about this guy, Oedipus, and the intergenerational trauma, Eva, of this man and what he does. Intergenerational starting from <laughs> King Laius into young Oedipus, and then what he does intergenerationally to his two sons and to his two daughters, it's Antigone and Esmine, and they represent what? Right. So his two daughters are forever clashing. Common sense and moral sense, right? Is the common sense? 
Esmin. And the moral sense, of course, is Antigone. This play is mostly studied ideologically in our schools. That's not what we're doing here, I promise you. Uh, we're doing something a little different. Very different. Okay, so those are his daughters, intergenerational trauma. His, his father abandons him, leaves him to, to die. <laughs> He's raised by a surrogate father. He ends up murdering his biological father. And this scar, which he tries to throw away, <laughs> comes back and is put into his children. We are part of like a, a, a connected line, right? That goes back multiple generations. And you have certain responsibilities generationally to hopefully interrupt or preclude the possibility of more trauma that's being passed on to your little ones in the future. So Ismin and Antigone, how about the sons? So you have common sense versus moral sense in his daughters. You have money versus the people in his sons. And his sons, by the way, murder each other, right? They're at war with one another to see who's going to be the next king. Now you got to ask yourself, is that the children's fault or is that the dad's fault? What we're looking at with Sophocles in this trilogy, we want to understand how intergenerational trauma works. What did the dad do wrong to make his daughters adopt the worldviews that they do that are forever clashing? What did he do to make his sons adopt the worldview that they adopt that are forever clashing? So if we can solve the Oedipus issue, very bold statement, by the way, uh, we can maybe prevent intergenerational trauma from being passed on in our own lives. So Greek tragedy, students, is really about lessons in shame. Listen closely, please. Lessons in shame. Here we're talking about true shame, Jun Chao, not an empty political platitude. Oh, I'm so sorry. On behalf of the Canadian government, here's a check. That's not shame, Justin Trudeau, if you're watching this. Um, true shame. Shame comes over us. These are stories about the realization of your collusion and complicity in tragedy, and ultimately their lessons in shame falling over you. Oedipus Tyrannus, the original version of, uh, of the play, the Rex part comes from the Romans, but the Greeks... Tyrannus, the tyrant. Oedipus, as you know, in the end of the play, gouges out his own eyes, right? He's a blind man into old age, trying to be forgotten, doesn't want his grave to even have his name. And here we are studying him, yeah? He wanted to be forgotten, to be erased from the past. We cannot, <laughs> because otherwise the past is not done with us. He gouges out his eyes, because everything he does from the moment of birth, I suppose, he does with his eyes wide open, with total certainty. He's convinced he's right. Oedipus is the brightest, the best, the ultimate STEM student, I've called him in the past, who, who's there to solve all the riddles, has all the rationality that you can imagine. And it's precisely that that makes him a tyrant, a tyrant who can't have shame fall on the eyelids. He can't look down. He's like this the whole time. That's why he gouges out his eyes. Only upon the realization that he's murdered his father and had sex with his own mother. Then he gouges out his eyes. He gouges out his eyes with the brooches of his mother's uh, gown, right? The things that hold her, what can we call it? integrity together, right? <clears throat> Lest she expose herself. That's what he gouges out his eyes with. Think about that for a second. So these are lessons in shame. If you learn your own past, personally, civilizationally, and you don't feel shame, <laughs> you're verging on the tyrannical. And that's the thing to avoid. I feel a question, question. Yeah. Yeah. Why do we need to experience shame to take away the lesson? Because 
first of all, from a Chinese perspective, you should have lots of opinions about this because China as a whole, civilizationally, uses shame quite effectively, does it not, in order to control the masses. First, ancient China we're talking, not just the contemporary little <laughs> political blip that we're calling communist, quote-unquote, China, in massive quotation marks because it's not quite communist. Put that to the side. You need shame because shame reminds you of your finitude as a human, right? We want to believe that we're infinite, that we're wise, that we can like algorithm our way through every problem, that we can solve death, that we can blah, 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 blah. No, you can't. <laughs> and shame on you for thinking you can, STEM student. Of course not Jun Chao, because he's a sweetheart, nor Hugo, because he's also a sweetheart. Shame on those who don't, who think that they're gods. They're not gods. We are not gods. We have to accept our, our finitude. So shame becomes the prerequisite of the lesson. If you're, I've used this example in the past. Lily, if you're not ashamed of who you were a year ago, you haven't learned enough in this life. Everybody should be ashamed of who they were a year ago because you think, how could I have thought such things? Erfan, a year ago, your digital <laughs> awareness of what's happening in this information bubble that we're in, I mean, if I were you, I'd be ashamed of that. And I'm pretty confident that you are. And that's not, I don't mean that as an attack. I mean that as actually a compliment <laughs> because, because that's the evidence that you're gonna grow if you can feel that shame. For myself, just to share a bit of some stuff, I'm so ashamed of like things I thought about love. Like if I go back, my God, it's stupid, th stupid ideas were in my head about it that are completely unsubstantiated. I'm ashamed of how I thought about it and now I have a very different view. But if I didn't feel the shame, I wouldn't, evolve in my perception of what it's about. Maybe you start to feel shame, Junchao, about, or Emma, about your education. Imagine, remember back in grade 12 and you're like, I know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do this and this and this. With certainty in your heart. And I, now you can appreciate it, had some amusement in my heart. Like, okay, kids, let's see what happens. Sorry, Lily. <laughs> but there's a kind of confidence that comes over you because you're like, yep, I've chosen it. Then you get in and you think, that's it, I've done it. No, it's just the beginning. <laughs> so when you look back on that time, you should feel some shame. And if, if you do, that's evidence of evolution and growth. And um, it's a good thing, actually. This, this is a moment where you should, you're not aware yet of the things that you should be ashamed of <laughs> over time. You'll feel that way. So to go back, Coral, to what you were saying, there's no escape from this. Everybody will feel it. It's just a question of how you metabolize it. Why does tragedy exist? Because you're full of rage, Emma. Think of what really makes you angry. Why does rage exist? Think of it civilizationally. You're full of rage inside. If you don't think that's there, it's just a question of context. It'll come out, I promise you. I just have to show you a couple of pictures. You're a young guy, you got testosterone coming out of you. All I need to do if I want to recruit you into the military is just show you a couple of images and tell you a story. And guess what's gonna happen? and an explosion of rage will come out of you because you've got a wound civilizationally inside of you. Rage, tragedy exists because of rage. The goal here is to break that cycle, which turns into violence. Why does rage exist? Because you're full of grief. You're full of grief. You haven't recovered from the grief of that genocide perpetuated by the Japanese on the Chinese. You didn't metabolize it. You didn't integrate it. So rage comes out of you. America is full of rage and ancestral grief, which fuels their wars, I would argue. We could talk about that later. You refuse to confront shame, to confront the past. And so rage flows from grief why are we full of grief? In part, we're full of grief because we're in a world that is full of war. Remember, it's a combat veteran talking, performed by other combat veterans, so that we stop the cycle of violence. That's what the tragedies are about in the way I'm presenting it in our class. I can't guarantee that other people will do it this way. 
those dark forces they're in every single person it's just a question of context and guys are the easiest to manipulate super easy to manipulate because they've got this testosterone hormone inside of them, speaking from experience here, which can make you do crazy things, right? Um, that's how war starts. The tragedians, the combat veterans, came back from the war and said enough of this. That's their message. Nobody listened. You're done with the past, the past is not done with you. And until we break that cycle, we're gonna keep killing each other. So, um, I want to read these things with precision because without that precision, we can't break the cycle uh, of violence. We're, we're talking about a period of 70 years. That's all that we're, we were looking at. 31 plays, 70 years, three people, all combat veterans, <laughs> talking about the lessons of shame that we need to absorb in order to stop the violence and, and the cycle of violence. The Persians, as an example, I've talked about this in the past, but Lily hasn't heard this message, nor has Emma or, or Coral or Eva or others. Amy, we'll test the memory of your heart. The best of me is in the enemy, and the worst in the enemy is in me. We start with that lesson, right? The best of me is in the foreigner, quote unquote, think of China and America. <laughs> the, the worst in them is in us. That's the lesson. It's a plea to his fellow countrymen and women to not perpetuate the cycle of violence. They came and invaded us. They burned our temples. They raped our women. We can't do that to them. We have to be better than that. We have to show them the right way. We have to not act on the rage. But it didn't work because there was too many people that experienced it and they didn't know how to integrate the grief. They couldn't. Turned into rage, turned into war. Persia invades twice, does it not? Defeated twice. Then a civil war starts. You know the basis of that civil war? Persian money. The Persians couldn't beat them militarily, so they thought, let's bribe them and get them to kill each other. grief that turns into rage that turns into war the best in me is in you the worst in you is in me that's what it is to be a human and um, the tragedies help us see that <laughs> so the, the, you know welcome to like a real education <laughs> lily <laughs> these are the things that that we need to put into the memory of our heart so that we can prevent more of the massive mistakes in the cycle of violence that's that's continuing in this world unfortunately So the tragedies are about that. It's fooling you into war, lying to you about war where there are no heroes. And every combat veteran will tell you the same story. There's no heroes in war. There's just people who survive and people who don't. Heroes are used by politicians to sell more war. Usually the most brave and the most beautiful die first because they're fighting for something. The ones that survive that are called heroes What are the major lessons? Well, first, there's a major lesson in regards to history. You're seeing what you're projecting into it. Your perception of just about anything is your desire to see something back there, oftentimes. So you, we have to think about history very carefully. So when you open a history book in a standardized curriculum in your high school, <laughs> private or public, you have to realize that that went through a government filter. And if it goes through a government filter, it has this little kink in it. <laughs> which um, is very problematic. And people say, I'm a patriot. I love America. I love China. I love Canada. Do you love China? Do you love Canada? Do you love America? Or are you just operating on a very distorted version of the past, which is the prerequisite for fake patriots? Yeah. Our friend Joseph Tussman, who is one of the key voices in the civic education curriculum, tells us uh, about what he calls the corruption, for the purposes of your notes, of understanding. Emma, the corruption of understanding is about as you, as you learn and 
internalize within yourself, it kind of corrupts you from acting. You, ca you can't, now you hesitate constantly because you're like, what should I do? I don't know what to do. <laughs> who's right? Who's wrong? What should I fight for? Should I fight at all? <laughs> do I even bother engaging in politics if it all turns into tragedy? If it's all doom? The corruption of understanding is um, what I think the tragedies basically engender in us, if I may use the word. It's corruption of understanding in a positive way. Like, we need hesitation. If, if you engage, like before, Lily, you engage the augmented reality of Apple Vision Pro, maybe a bit of, like, hesitation is warranted. Like, see what happens with other people. <laughs> And then, you know, maybe at that point, like, decide to yourself, for yourself. But the corruption of understanding is, is, a, is a, you're forcing yourself to slow down. So we need to give ourselves a time to look back and to think. This is what's denied to us in terms of our obsession of the present and the obsession with the future. It's all about what's on the horizon. And we're all running, running, running forward, 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 forever. Wait a minute, kid. Before you go over there, let's see what's back here. And then we can step forward cautiously. If we do that, maybe we avoid the violence. Maybe. That's honestly the only hope. <laughs> What's for sure is if we don't do that, we won't avoid the violence. That's my belief anyways. So really, this is an elaborate exercise in cultivating a historical sensibility, this part of our PP program. We need to make sure that we do not murder or ancestralize the past. If you do not acknowledge the past, you're doomed to repeat it. For Critchley, the question of the future, he calls it an ideology of the future, that's what we have, is the wrong question. With a richer understanding of history, we equip ourselves with the armaments, the story of our origins, the catastrophic mess that we all come out of. Um, that mess back there that you don't want to look too early on. <laughs> And we all come from a mess. Everybody comes from some kind of a mess. So it's hard to look at it because it's embarrassing. It's shameful. A historical sensibility means that you, s you see what happened there and, and, and why, yeah, why that happened. I could talk to you about this in different ways. In doing so, you're amplifying your life, the present moment, and the prospects of confronting the future. If you don't develop that sensibility you can't really move forward in a meaningful way and i think we're mostly an ahistoric society please tell me if i'm wrong may i ask like how how has history been presented to you so, so far in your standard schooling my direct in the interest of total transparency here ambition is to help you hold on to your free thinking and critical thinking and to cultivate those things and ideology gives often a simplified version of the past that easily can turn into grief rage war and that's the thing to avoid who's got time for antiquity what could be less relevant people say to themselves we need to stretch out where we are we need to give blood to let the ghosts speak to us. That's the main point in many ways. Here's a juicy thing to say about that. Uh, here are some examples of contemporary tragedies. So there, like, we can look at Prometheus, we can look at um, the Oedipus story, which we will, the Agamemnon story, the Orestes case, which we will. But you don't have to go all the way back to the Greeks. You can go to the 1920s, 100 years ago. Here's a show, which is super spicy, called The Boardwalk Empire. It's a tragedy. <laughs> Here's another show about the 1950s and 60s, which is another kind of tragedy, also in America. Here's another show. It's called Succession. <laughs> it's about the contemporary moment. It's another tragedy. So tragedy is everywhere. If you look for it, if you understand its value, its role, tragedy is an emergency break. It forces you to stop, think, develop the corruption of understanding, and then walk much more consciously into the present and future.